and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today, the host of Collider Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Collider Movie Talk. A lot of cool things to talk about. Let's get into it. Also, the host of Collider Heroes, John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on? I blame Fernandez, first of all, for everything. And uh, <laughs> how's it going? I had to shave. What's up? <laughs> Babies. And also joining us, the senior editor of Nerdist, Dan Casey. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having uh -huh. me. Happy to be here. Yeah, Dan Casey. It's me. Right. Welcome. All right, Natasha, what's up first? Okay, earlier this year, we were introduced to the new Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War. The decision to reboot the Web Slinger once again came about as a result of an un unprecedented collaboration with Marvel Studios that has Marvel taking the creative lead on the new Spider-Man movies distributed by Sony. The decision to age Peter Parker down and tell a high school set story was one of the first made when Marvel was granted creative control of the character. And while Homecoming will certainly stand out in that regard, the question fans have now is how long will this idea last? When Collider's own Steve Weintraub got the chance to speak with Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige at Comic-Con 2016, he asked him if the intention is to keep Peter in high school if they get the chance to make sequels. Should we be able to make more after that? Sure. This is sophomore year. Is the next one junior year? Is the next one senior year? Is there a summer break between each of those? I don't know what, but it was sort of how we do a journey for Peter not dissimilar for what the students of Hogwarts would go through each of their years, which was one of the early ideas we had for the movies. Though it's unassumed we'll be seeing a sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming, an official announcement has not been released. Spider-Man Homecoming opens July 7th, 2017. Christian, what do you think about the Spider-Man movies following a similar model as Harry Potter. Uh, I dig it. I like the idea that they're doing this because we were. We, we, did you see? Were you in the Marvel panel for this? Yeah. Okay. So the the tone that they got for this particular Homecoming trailer was that John Hughes trailer that they were pitching that or the feel that this movie would be. So Tom Holland's also blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it. That he's he's one of these guys like uh, our own Cody Hall that'll look like he's 16 until he's 35. Yeah. Um, and so you can keep doing that. And, he, and he's really how old is he for real? He's uh, 19. He's I like believe. 19. 19. So yeah. you can do this. I mean, they did the same thing with Daniel Radcliffe for the Harry Potter movie. So you can do this, and I think you should do this if the first one works. And it looked like this is what we saw that this that this was going to work and the tone that they're going to set. And you have to make sure you do Spider-Man right, obviously, hence being a Spider-Man movie. But I think um, I like that they're going to keep him there because the, the thing that they pitched on the panel for Spider-Man that just sold me immediately was they said, imagine if you were 15 years old, you were Spider-Man, you heard the, the coolest girls, the most popular, the hottest girls talking about Spider-Man and how great Spider-Man was, and you couldn't say anything. You're 15 years old and you want, you are Spider-Man, you can't say crap, that's what this kid is going through throughout his years, and I think you, it opens it up to be a lot of fun. Dan, how do you feel about it? I agree, I think the decision to make Peter Parker high school age is a smart one, because that was one of the best parts of Civil War. You have this scrawny, slender teenager standing next to like hulking people like Captain America and Iron Man, and that not only makes for an interesting visual, but it also makes for you know more fascinating storytelling, sure. better comedy. It's just a better contrast. You don't really there's nothing else like Peter Parker age-wise, character-wise in the MCU right now, and I think it's something it sorely needs. And I also think that it's a fun opportunity to finally see a high school-aged Peter Parker in high school. Right. And look, Andrew Garfield, I thought he was a great Peter mm -hmm. Parker, but he looked like he was an undercover cop trying to bust a drug <laughs> ring at uh, Midtown High. Like right. he skateboards onto stage. Like I don't believe that from Andrew Garfield. I would believe that from Tom Holland. Yeah. Same with Tobey Maguire, he was in high school, and it was like that right. guy's like 32 yeah. or whatever. But it's like Steve yeah. from Beverly Hills 902. Holland yeah. looks like he's, he's a like, kid in high school, and all the other kids that they cast that they brought on stage, and and they showed a little clip of him in high school doing a bunch of high school stuff, but also some Peter Parker Spider Man stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think doing a high school uh, series going every year sophomore junior senior that's three movies right there and then he also mentioned hey and there's also summer school right they could rock five movies all within that period of time and i'd love to see them do it but obviously we have to see the movie first and hopefully it's great exactly and the the harry potter model they're talking about in particular i really resonates with me because i started reading the harry potter books at a time where i was the same age as him 
every book in every movie right, that came right. out. So you sort of grew up with the character, and for a generation of kids, you know, they're tra older people in the MCU might be phasing out as their contracts, and right. this gives a new generation of moviegoers someone that they can grow up with and see on the big screen. That's yeah. a great point because you got, you're going to have to do that as like, like you're saying. Once you lose the Downies and Evans, who's going to be the who's going to be the focus, and who better than like Spider Man? And when you, and when you have Spider Man throughout these movies, is that the question is? I just hope that they don't fall into the trap that other Spider-Man movies did. Is as they get through these movies, they start piling on villains. I'm hoping that this model makes them stay away from the overpopulation of villains. Well, the greatest thing about Spider-Man is his rogues gallery is like equal to Batman. Mm -hmm. He's got incredible right. villains, and we already know. That, all right, so Vulture is going to be in there. There's maybe a little Tinkerer dude, possibly shocker. the Shocker. That's enough. Leave the, you know, hey, that's good. We got Scorpion, Mysterio, yeah. you know, a whole bunch of other You see him walk by in the background. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, they mentioned that Tinkerer and Shocker were going to be in it. That leaked on a toy panel at right. Comic-Con. I'm hoping that they just have, what I've heard about Tinkerer is he's going to be sort of like a thread throughout the sure. MCU, sort of supplying supervillains with weaponry. And I'm hoping that Shocker is just sort of like a throwaway at the beginning almost of him like, hey, here's Spider-Man doing something Spider-Man-y, stopping a villain, and right. that's sort of the end of Shocker. Right. All right, what's next? One of the bigger revelations at Comic-Con 2016 was during the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 presentation at the Marvel panel. Fans there were officially introduced to a smaller version of Groot, now affectionately known as Baby Groot. This led to a lot of questions from the fans, par particularly does this mean Groot still has his memories? Collider Steven Weintraub posts a very question to Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige backstage shortly after the Marvel panel, and Feige answered by comparing the character to Spock in Star Trek. He remembers, he remembers, he's not meant Mentally a baby, he is still Groot. I sort of equate it to Spock, Shirka, the end of Search for Spock, and the voyage home. Feige went on to say that the dynamic between Rocket and baby Groot will continue to be a centerpiece of the sequel. When it comes to a Guardians of the Galaxy film, a James Gunn script, it's not just about the funny, it's not just about the action, it's about the heart and the amount of heart that you get out of this trash panda raccoon. And now this little twig, baby Groot, is actually awe inspiring. It is amazing what he's done with those two characters. Schnepp, what do you think about the comments made by Kevin Feige. I believe him. I mean, when he's referring to Spock as Spock from the, you know, the search for Spock, it's like, yeah, that's Spock, but he's not 100% Spock yet. So this isn't going to be like the I am Groot guy. This is like a little baby Groot. And we saw like a five minute clip of baby Groot and they're like, go get this thing. And then he goes and brings them like a sandwich, brings them a glove, brings them. So it's not like he's like 100% Groot. It's Groot, but it's just not full Groot. It's baby Groot. You'll see. It's great. I love baby Groot. They're going to make billions of dollars with little plush baby Groots. It's insane. Everyone in the audience was like, oh, yeah. like baby Groot just stole the show. And the scene with Yondu. Come on, man. I was like, I cannot wait to see this film. Well, it also makes a lot of sense considering where it picks up. It's only a few months after the events right. of the first movie, and we saw what happened to Groot at the end of that movie. So it's cool that he does have all his memories, and you see that in that particular scene that you're talking about. Even when he's, he's kind of running after somebody, he's still able to kind of shoot mm. the, his, you know, his arms out. But he's not, yelling. Not, yeah, he's screaming and yelling. He's not able to do the things that he was able to do as when he was large. Oh, oh, I am Groot. Uh, but now he's, got, he's baby Groot. He's got the baby voice. But with the memories, I like the Explanation. I also liked Feige's further explanation into James Gunn and what you're going to get as far as the heart. Because with the stuff that we saw, that scene plus that extended trailer, you absolutely got the heart through everything with the with the character of Baby Groot. But what the stuff that they showed with Kurt Russell and what they showed with even with, with Star Lord and Gamora, there's so much more to it than just the funny and the violence, as Feige said. And that came across in just the stuff that we saw. And I think when they finally released the trailers and, and the footage to the rest of the public, you're going to feel that also. Because I think Gunn has such a hold on this now that he just he's kind of like lives and breathes it. So I, I totally agree with everything that Feige's saying here. Exactly. Gunn Gunn knows these characters inside and out, and he took what was arguably a C-list super team and made them one of the biggest groups in the mm -hmm. world. And I think the relationship between Groot and Rocket is going to take an interesting turn in this movie. Much like Star-Lord is trying to reconnect with his father, Rocket is going to take over sort of a paternal, mm -hmm. uh, he's going to have a paternal relationship with Baby Groot. He's going to feel the need to protect him because now Baby Groot's going to have to ride on Rocket's shoulder. Right. He can't stand the other way, otherwise he'd snap him like a little twig. Right. And I think you're also going to see that echoed a little bit with Gamora and you know her dad out there, Thanos, uh, searching for all the Mon Cala beads of the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you're going to see interesting parallels with each character in the Guardians trying to reconnect with the paternal or maternal figure. 
Yep. All right. What's next? Deadline is reporting that New Line Cinema has quickly ordered a sequel to Lights Out, the $5 million budgeted horror movie produced by James Wan that pulled in over $21 million its opening weekend. Much of the same creative team behind the film returns for the sequel, including director David Sandberg, his wife and producer Lotta Lawson, and James Wan and Eric Heisler already set to pen the script. No word yet on concerning the return of any cast members. Dan, are you excited for a sequel to Lights Out? Let me preface this by saying I have not seen Lights Out yet because I'm what some would term a coward when it comes to horror movies. <laughs> they frighten me. I get real scared real quick. That being said, I'm happy for the filmmakers involved, but I am a little bummed out that that's the first instinct of a studio to rush to sequelize something. So one of the things that excited me about Lights Out from a filmmaking perspective is right. that it's a fresh, original property. It's not a reboot. It's mm -hmm. not a sequel. It's not a remake. It was something new, something fresh. And I think that's sorely lacking in today's movie landscape. So maybe uh, this is something worthy of a sequel. I haven't seen it, so I can't comment where that's concerned. But just from a film going perspective, it bums me out a little bit that they're like, OK, let's just slap a two on it and make it again. I think I agree with that. But I will also say I think for a business side of things, I think that there was always the plan from what the strategy is and how they, they make these movies, the budget that they make these movies, they look at them and they say, okay, if this movie in, in week one makes 15, 20 million on the $5 million budget, then we should start thinking about it. I'm sure they already had, because look, it's, it's, it's Blumhouse that did, that did this. So they, they have done this model right. many times. Mm -hmm. So I guarantee you, by the time that they just started doing this movie, if our model works again, let's get the second one. Just we'll have the announcement ready to go because they just know how to do it. Now you're right, though. Like a lot of times, it's just the movie's a success, like the sequel. I just think that this particular plan for their business model makes a lot of sense. Um, and now whether or not they have it creatively and they're not just turning them out to make that money and not just get profit, we'll, is, you know, we'll, we'll see once they release it. But I get it. And on a business standpoint, I get why they would do this because it's already a huge profit on the five million or whatnot it took to make it. Yeah, I mean, if, I think the director was already or is already directing another sequel called Annabelle 2. Because after he made right. uh, Lights Out, I think James Wan was like, dude, take over this. You know, we already want, want to make an Annabelle 2 to make up for the first one that sucked. <laughs> yeah. So can you please make, make a good Annabelle? Because this guy did a really good job. I saw Lights Out and it was a really good, uh, you know, fright film, scary film. Uh, it ratcheted up the tension the entire time I saw it. There were a lot of really dumb decisions some of the characters made were like, don't go downstairs. But because it, they were all tied in with the family, it made sense. Otherwise, you'd be out the door. You wouldn't be like, mm -hmm. but so they, they really, it made sense that people aren't getting out of this freaky situation. Uh, I loved it. And so lights still out, whatever they're gonna call, call the, the next electrician. one. electrician. Yeah, so <laughs> lights be going out again. What I, hopefully it's not just lights out too. You know, it's like, let's get a little creative there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see a second, uh, maybe even a, not even a bigger budget, but just like another person having to deal with this character who's, you know, freaky with the light switch. So, <laughs> all right. Well, now it's time for buy or sell. Natasha's going to read some more topics in the world of movie news. And myself, Dan and Schnepp will just buy or sell it. Natasha, what are we buying or selling? Universal has released the first trailer for Split, the latest film from writer-director M. Night Shyamalan, which puts Shyamalan squarely back into his psychological thriller mode. The film stars James McAvoy as Kevin, a man who abducts three teenage girls who suddenly realize that Kevin is one of 23 personalities displayed by McAvoy's character, who suffers from a severe case of multiple personality disorder. The movie reunites Shyamalan with producer James Blun, oh, Jason Blun, who produced his first foray into the found footage genre, The Visit. The film will open in theaters on January 20th, 2017. Christian, buy or sell the first trailer for M. Night Split. I have not been on the Shyamalan train for a very long time, and I didn't love The Visit, but I'm buying this trailer pretty big. I think this is the type of movie I want to see Shyamalan do for sure. I liked his team up with Blum. I thought that it was a, it, it, I, even though I didn't love The Visit, I still thought it was his best movie in a while. I thought it definitely got some creepy scares out of it. But teaming up with McAvoy also, and watch, and this is a role that you could see McAvoy really knocking out of the park. Um, and I like the idea of it for sure. I think that you could see him. Uh, how many? Twenty two. Twenty three personalities. That beats Sybil. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, well, it beats it beats Eddie Murphy it and beats, the yeah. professor. Also. Right. So yeah. he's like the Dr Pepper of mental health disorders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every yeah, time so, he drinks a swig, and I'm a different person. You know. I, so I, I want to see what happens. I'll tell you though, I I actually am rooting against a twist. 
I don't really want to see. I don't think that Shaman has to do a twist in every movie. I think that he feels like he's got to do it because it's his thing now. But I prefer. I know that this kind of calls for one almost, to where which is the one that's going to wind up the, having the, all the other multiple. Who saves him? Is it the little kid personality? You know, is it what kind of battle is he going to fight himself like Edward Norton in Fight Club? What's going to happen? Yes. <laughs> um, but it's a good idea. I love the idea. I love the trailer. I think it, it's straight out creepy, and McAvoy is a talent that can pull this off. So I'm going to buy it big. I'm also going to buy this. Uh, like you, I have been uh, off of M. Night Shyamalan ever since I was deeply betrayed in the theater when I went to go see The Village. That movie yeah. is hot trash. Yeah. Don't go see it. Uh, yeah, no, this movie looks great. Uh, I think that James McAvoy is the perfect choice to play someone like this. He looks like he seemed like a manic Professor X almost. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really liked it, and I agree with you. I don't think there needs to be a twist. Having no twist would be a twist in and of itself, right. so he'd still have his bases covered. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely, based on this trailer, I am 100% there on opening day. Totally sure that there is a twist, guys. I'm but sure. I'm still buying it. There's I a 24th there's personality. A, yeah, that's right. Someone and on is, the trailer. Yeah, he's someone. Ego, the living planet. <laughs> oh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm buying the trailer. I thought it was really fun. You didn't know. At first, you're like, oh, this is going to be one of these kind of like hostage films or almost like a ho more horrifying version of The Room. You right. know, it's like. Um, but no, it's actually going to be worse than that because now they have to deal with this guy who's got like, like 23 different personalities and you know some will probably be nice, some will be singing songs to the girls, cooking dinner, others will be abusive, how are these girls going to escape? escape yeah. yeah, so uh, it sounds fun. What's the twist going to be, Shama Shama Lama? Anime? Uh, uh, <laughs> Natasha, you watched this trailer, what did you think? So creepy. I mean, just James McAvoy's face when it changes with all the different characters, I'm like, oh no. Oh no, so scary. And that whole scene in the beginning when he gets in the car, I don't know if that's ever happened to you once, but a lady that I didn't know actually got in my car once oh. and I was like in the other seat and I'm like, uh, oh. hello. So just knowing Lock like that's doors. something that can actually happen. Yeah, so whew, it was like taken, but psychological thriller yeah. creepiness yeah. happening. Reverse Uber driver actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. Like this is the Uber driver story gone wrong. Yeah. Really, so scary. <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> The new trailer for Gavin O'Connor's The Accountant, starring Ben Affleck and Anna Kendrick, has been released, giving us a better look at both the young and adult versions of the title character, Christian Wolf. As it was explained in the film's first trailer, Wolf is a special boy with amazing genius-level skill sets and crippling anxiety, which later turns him into a cold, calculating character that seems to shun normal human interaction. Wolf then begins working with some of the world's worst and most dangerous criminals. The film also stars J.K. Simmons, John Bernthal, Jeffrey Tambor, and John Lithgow. Gow. The Accountant opens in the U.S. theaters on October 14th. Schnepp Byer sell the new trailer for The Accountant. Well, as Josh McCuga calls it, The Accountant, but I like to call it The Accountant. <laughs> um, I buy this trailer a big time. This is this looks like a lot of fun. Uh, ben Affleck is at it again, making awesome movies. So, I mean, there's nothing I can say that I didn't enjoy about this trailer other than this is just another trailer from the first one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I feel like they didn't give away too much. They just give you just enough we get J.K. Simmons kind of, that must be sort of towards the beginning of the movie where he's like, who is this guy? He's doing deals, he's doing this, he's doing that. And then while they're doing that, they're showing a little setup. And then you also realize he's also kind of weird and has issues and everything's all strangely orderly. And then he gets involved with Anna Kendrick. So there, I've, I've told you the trailer. No, it's a, it's actually, there's a lot more, but it's very exciting to me, so I buy it. Yeah, a huge buy for me on this one, two for two, because I think that I love the first trailer that we saw. I thought it was one of the best trailers that we'd seen so far. I think that it is. this is Ben Affleck's Bourne mm, uh, franchise totally. that he's gonna be able to get. And I really like, I, I think that the, for me, and I think I said it, that it, my problem that I had with the new Jason Bourne movie, I think it's similar, we have the similar thoughts, is that there was more action to it and there wasn't enough to the character, like there wasn't the first three, there wasn't enough to the story, that just, it wasn't as intricate as the first three. This one, that, excuse me, not this one, but this movie looks intricate, it looks involved, it looks like there's gonna be a lot to this character, and I also love the fact that Gavin O'Connor is doing this. I think mm. Warrior is one of the most underrated movies out there. If you haven't seen Warrior, you should. I love that film. I love what Gavin O'Connor did with that film, and I think that he and Ben Affleck working together is encouraging, and I did like that exchange. So it seems like Anna Kendrick has been running into these types of roles, though, too, to where she right. stumbles across. I think she just did it with Sam Rockwell recently, whatever that movie. That, Me, him, her. Yeah. Or what, no, it's uh, Mr. Right. Mr. Right, which is essentially was kind of gross point blank, but this is not gross point blank, but it's still a similar premise in a darker movie mm. but I love what I'm seeing so far big buy uh, I'm going to have to go against the grain. This is a massive sell for me. Really? I was on board with the wow. first trailer, but this one was corny. It was by the numbers. It was so wow. 
bad when you compare it to that first one, which was so well cut. It was sure. exciting. This to me just looks like Jason Bourne on the spectrum. Hey, mm. what if Batman was good at math? Like <laughs> this to me does not instill confidence. It seems like they were afraid that people didn't understand the first trailer, so they mm. had to dumb it down. And to me, that makes me doubt the movie. It makes me less excited to see it. And honestly, after seeing this trailer, I don't know if I'm going to be there on opening day. Damn I was Casey. intrigued yeah. before. I love wow. look. I love Gavin O'Connor. I love Ben Affleck. I love Anna Kendrick. I love J.K. Simmons. I liked all the component parts. But from the first trailer, which was more about his character, really right. got into who Ben Affleck is playing yeah. and issues as to why he would be perfect as this dual role thing. That's why I like the second trailer because they get into the rest of the story. This to me gave away too much. Wow. I, like there, what? There's going to be seven more minutes of action, like with people being like, "Oh, he's here now. He has the documents. <laughs> right. We should kill him." No, I don't need to see that. Leave a little mystery in there. Trust you know, that people are going. Like the, uh, they call him the accountant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, uh, like a CPA? <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. That's a good. It's another movie to make. Yeah. The CPA. the CPA. Our first. Our first disagreement here on the on Yay. the trailer panel. All right. What's next? <laughs> Lionsgate has unveiled the very first trailer for director Mel Gibson's World War II drama Hacksaw Ridge, which marks Gibson's first directorial effort since 2006's Apocalypto. Based on a true story, the film stars Andrew Garfield as. Desmond Doss, a conscientious collaborator and army medic who refused to bear arms during World War II, but ended up saving 75 men during the bloodiest battle of the war without firing a single bullet. The movie is written by Robert Shaikhan, Andrew Knight, and Braveheart scribe Randall Wallace, and stars Sam Worthington, Luke Bracey, Teresa Palmer, Hugo Weaving, Rachel Griffiths, and Vince Vaughn. The movie is scheduled to open on November 4th. Dan, your thoughts on the first trailer for Hacksaw Ridge? For the first minute of this trailer, it was a sell. But then things took a turn when they actually showed them in battle, and I just felt like shivers up my arm, and then it became a massive buy for me. I think it's a really fascinating story. You know, this untold story of this conscientious objector who enlisted in World War II, but still refused to fire a single bullet, which is impossible to imagine when you think about the scope of that war. Then you yep. see the battle scenes and this real life story of someone who saved 75 people. It's inspiring. You know, say what you will about Mel Gibson and I'm sure you're saying that in the chat right now, but I think that this film looks great and there's a lot of terrible people out there that make great films. Yeah, all right. Well, so Luke's daughter maybe is going to win five bucks because this is a huge buy for me. I'm buy I'm, I'm out of money. I am out of money because <laughs> all three of these trailers I loved and I loved mm -hmm. this one. Like you said, we all know that uh, Mel Gibson has had more than a few problems sure. in his past, but the man can make a movie. He uh, Braveheart's still one of my favorite movies of all time and my probably my top five. Apocalypto was amazing. I know you're a big fan of that movie as well. Uh, and this looks like another one on his resume. The guy knows how to make films. He knows how to make war films and he knows how to capture th that kind of that emotion and that feeling and tell a great story. He's always been able to tell a great story. This looks like a great story to be told. You see that. You see this. You're absolutely right. When you just like to, to, to when you realize what happened, the, sc the scale of how how this guy was able to do this. And Andrew Garfield is a guy that needs this kind of spotlight shine on him because he really is a, a great actor. I mean, I didn't love 99 Homes, but he, he was great in that film. So to see him do this, to work with Gibson, and you kind of know what's going to happen as it go through, like, uh, all right, kid, you want to use him? I'll punch you in the face. And like then they start protecting him at the end. Right. Great, that's fine. Let me see that. But I like this, and I think it's going to be even more controversial because I think we're going to hear about this movie a lot in the Oscars. What I found very fascinating, by the way, was when they, they didn't tell you when it comes up it doesn't say by director Mel Gibson it goes from the guy who did Braveheart right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you don't mention Mel Gibson's name anywhere which I think is smart to be honest with you but what, what yeah, do you I think, think that's how they marketed Airbender from the dude from the Sixth Sense right the, um, <laughs> yeah I gotta sell this no I'm just kidding I yeah. loved it uh, <laughs> I buy this it was a, a very uh, a very uh, emotional uh, trailer. I mean, it really kind of brings you through in almost like a, in a full metal jacket kind of way, the way, way he's treated by uh, his comrades at the beginning of, the, right. of, of his training, where they're like, what's wrong? You don't want to hold a gun, this and that. You, want, you don't want to kill anybody. And, and having to deal with that, and then to see that actually kind of come through in the battlefield, and actually he's actually even uh, maybe saving more people than, than killing people. So I think... Uh, it's going to have a, a, a you know a political statement, an emotional impact, and that's what I felt from the trailer, and I really buy it. I think Mel Gibson, say what you will about his uh, personal life, but as a filmmaker, he is incredible. All right, and before we move on, I just also want to let you guys know that we did some reactions and reviews to some of these trailers today. Both Dennis and Schnepp did a reaction to The Accountant, correct? 
No, the, to Hacksaw Ridge. To Hacksaw Ridge, excuse me. And then both Wendy and Natasha did the reaction to Split. Yeah. So, what? <laughs> What'd I say? Wendy and Perry. Wendy and Perry. Wendy, well, I was close. Wendy and Perry. I, I haven't seen it. I've been and, working. And Josh McCuga did a very special reaction to The Accountant, which you can <laughs> see Accutant. on YouTube. You can go there and see. We did reviews and reactions, and you, I guarantee you somebody who works here did them. All right. Now, <laughs> someone else who works here is Wendy Lee, and she is in the chat room looking at all your comments. Wendy, what are they saying? When they're talking about Baby Groot's memory being explained in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the chat loves gay Baby Groot, and they can't wait to see him return in the sequel. Jack Miles says, This adds to the wisdom of a character who can only say three words, but might have lived multiple lifetimes. And Tyrus QW says, Haven't even seen him, but I am already in love with Baby Groot's smart idea on how to work his memory. And moving on to our Buy or Sell section, first trailer for Hacksaw Ridge. Seeing a lot of buys for Hacksaw Ridge trailer. Some are saying that this film could score an Oscar nomination for uh, Andrew Garfield. Dan Allen says, wow, this is an amazing story. I am happy to see Andrew Garfield in these kinds of roles after Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. All right, thank you, Wendy. Now it's Jump, kick, a grenade. Oh, you like yeah, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. He is Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone said, I saw in one of the comments on the uh, trailer, it's just, that he just bend it like Beckham with a grenade. It's pretty <laughs> fun. <laughs> All right, now it's time for opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. Natasha, something's coming out this week. What is it? Bad Moms is out this week. Young Amy, played by Mila Kunis, has a great husband, overachieving children, beautiful home, and successful career. Unfortunately, she's also overworked, exhausted, and ready to snap. Fed up, she joins forces with two other stressed, stressed out mothers, played by Kristen Bell and Katherine Hahn, to get away from daily life and conventional responsibilities. As the gals go wild with their newfound freedom, they set themselves up for the ultimate showdown with Queen Bee, Gwendolyn, and her clique of seemingly perfect moms. Okay, so I, I don't think anybody here saw the movie yet. Ellis saw the movie, just uh, was putting out a review on it. And from what he said, he got a lot of laughs out of this film. Um, there are certain things in the trailer that I said, okay, I could see where the, this, this chemistry could be really funny. I think that it also could be something where I walk out going that just wasn't for me. Um, but I don't know what to expect. I do like the actresses in, in the movie. I want to continue to hear more things about it. I am going to try to go see it this weekend. But from what I hear... Not a great movie, but some good laughs. And that's kind of all I need to see if I'm sitting down. I just thought, as long as I get, for me, a comedy, as long as it's peppering in the laughs, and by the end of it, I go, okay, wasn't the best film, but I did laugh a handful of times. That's kind of all I need from a comedy. How about you? I Again, I have not seen the film. I've read several reviews. I hear fantastic things about Katherine Hahn. I hear she yeah. really steals the show. Overall, I hear it's a little aggressive in its tone and its gender politics. But, you know, if you're just trying to beat the heat for a couple hours this weekend, there's worse ways to do it. But that being said, I would go see a movie that's going to leave theaters soon, like Hunt for the Wilder People or Swiss Army Man, mm -hmm. or support a smaller indie movie. Mm. What do you got, Schnell? Yeah, I agree. No, so you don't want to see the movie? No, I'll totally see it later. Fair no, enough. I'm going to see A Hunt for the Wilder People. I agree. I'm saying it's probably a lot of people are going to go see this film in opening weekend, but there's also a lot of independent films to go see, uh, Swiss Army Man. But why not? If you want to laugh and see a cool R-rated film, Ellis definitely said there was a ton of laughs in this yeah. film, so I will see it eventually. But i got a lot of other films on my list right now. All right. Thank you. And once again, that's brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. It's opening this week. Now it's time, we're gonna move on to mailbag, but also remember we're gonna take a few live Twitter questions, so make sure you are tweeting out to at Collider Video, and make sure Natasha underscore Martinez. Natasha Lexus underscore. Just not getting it right Get it today, right. guys, I apologize. <laughs> so anyway, make sure you do that, and you guys, she's gonna be going through it, she's the gatekeeper, and we'll pick out some of those questions, but now it's time for mailbag. What are they saying? Casey Dinan writes, Hey Collider crew, I love the show and watch every day. With the news from Celebration of Star Wars Episode 8 opening immediately after The Force Awakens, do you think they're breaking the tradition of opening in space? Could they open in space and cut to Luke and Rey without it feeling choppy or broken? How do you want the film to open? Thanks and keep up the great work. I think you could still open in space. I think, yeah, why not? You, Absolutely. You, you just open like a panning shot in space and you pan down slowly through the atmosphere, then back to the island. Yeah. And I she's think. been holding that you know, for yeah. three years. Please. Yeah. I can't hold my it. My arm is so tired. Yeah. I think that's exactly what they're going to do. I think that they're going to have that. You'll have the crawl. You kind of explain what's happening, that the, 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 the galaxy is still mourning the loss of Han Solo, and that you're going to be all these things that are happening in the universe. And then, yes, you're absolutely right. They're going to pan down to whatever the hell the name of the planet is called. 
and they'll go into the island and they'll just pick right back up to him handing the lightsaber. That's exactly what's going on. I don't want that to happen at all. No? I want the movie to just, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Not in space? No, then just cuts to her holding that thing. Oh, wow. Have some dialogue with Luke, this, that, and the other, and then pan up to space. I mean, either pan up to space or do something where then you introduce Star Wars. I, I think they could do it, and no one would be upset. Mm -hmm. But I think it. I I personally feel like every other Star Wars film that's ever been made, uh, in between the sequels or prequels or whatever, there's a period of time that has elapsed, and if you're not gonna allow that to move the story forward. I feel like you're missing out on some. I mean, I, I, it feels it just feels weird to me. I feel like they should like Luke should have trained Ray for three years or two years. And yeah. so that should be happening after the title. Yeah, that's my feeling about it. Whether I'm right or wrong. I do you know? like I do like that idea that if they're going to pick it up immediately where it left off, just immediately starting where it yeah. left off, almost like you're watching one continuous movie. Yes. Yeah. All right. What's next? Okay, Lewis writes, who has the best voice in Hollywood? Most commanding, most unique, most sexy. I know you're all Star Wars nerds, so you can't choose James Earl Jones. Love the show, love TV talk. I'll tell you this too. Uh, Liam Neeson, obviously, that's why he voices everything. Mm. I mean, he's even in, what's that, that brand new movie that's coming out with the... Uh, Bad Moms? Not Bad Moms. <laughs> no. Uh, the one, Turbo the, Lover? Nope. It's about the kid that he imagines stuff and then there's that... The mo Monster Falls. Yeah, yeah, he's the monster. monster whatever that was. Yeah, he's, he is. He's Groot. And he's great in that movie. But I'll tell you, I, I interviewed Colin Farrell. The guy's got a soothing voice, man. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just like, it's, it's Colin Farrell and I think that both Liam Neeson, those two, one commanding, I can understand why Colin Farrell does as well as he does. I gotta go with Reg E. Kathy. Uh, his voice is like pouring motor oil. Mm. It is just buttery, rich, basso profundo. <laughs> it is just, like I could listen to that all day. You might know him from House of Cards. He played Freddy, the guy who owned the barbecue joint. Mm -hmm. He's currently on Outcast, where he plays, I think, uh, Chief Giles. And uh, he was in Seven. That guy's been working forever in a day, and his voice is just, it'll send shivers up your spine. Uh, I'm going with William Shatner. There you go. Price negotiator guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love Priceline. <laughs> yes, the coffee. Priceline um, negotiator. Yeah. Someone else, you know, someone picked uh, Scarlett Johansson, who's got a very oh, nice. sexy voice. Yeah, she was great. Um, I loved her voiceover work in her in particular. It was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, now it's time for a live Twitter questions. You guys have been submitting some. Natasha's going to go through them, and she picked up a couple. What do you got? Okay, Ryan Field asks if you could go back in time and be a fly on the wall during the production of any movie, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. That is a very good question. Clockwork Orange. Ooh, interesting. That would be an interesting one. That would be. I feel like that's a weird set to be. I'm sure it'd be really weird. But yeah, like, he was just using the book. You know, they didn't even have a script. Yeah, He'd walking around with the book. I just want to see like how crazy. Like you just see to see somewhat normal people kind of getting into that craziness. Okay, now you're normal. Now you're the craziest person in the history of the universe. Go. Uh, there's a bunch that I want to see from a cinephile perspective, but. I have to go with the room because oh God, yes. I need to know what it was like to be there. You can read, uh, you can read Greg Sestero's book, but I want to see him with his two cameras side by side, one film, one digital, making that trash to piece. <laughs> I will go with uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, and I, from the beginning till they left. Oh my you God, lose your mind! Yeah, You're yeah, gonna yeah, get I'm dysentery, Schnapp. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm all into the adventure. All right, what's next? Cody Miller asks, how much does it hurt to open an Oscar-worthy movie in the summer or earlier in the year? Does it matter? Yes, it does matter. I think it hurts a lot. I think a perfect example of that is Cinderella Man. I think Cinderella Man is a movie that could have at least got a couple of looks, uh, but it came out in June or July, if whatever year it came out, and it hurt it really badly. Um, because you go back and watch that movie, that has no business being in the summertime, but had it been released in like November, which it seems it could, I think there would have been more talk about it for sure. Oscar. So it happens often. I think that's something, I mean, even what's the, uh, the fo founder? Is that the one that was Yeah, the yeah. founder got pushed back to a more awards friendly day. Yeah. It yes. was gonna release in August. That would have hurt it. And I think that yeah. they knew that. I think it, from one year, that looks, especially with the, with the pull that Michael Keaton has right now with Oscars, his last two movies have been all over the awards. Yeah. So I think that this that's, that's a smart move to move it out. Now, sometimes you look at Ex Machina, which came out in March of last year, and it, it was up for a few things last year, but it, did, it, didn't, it wasn't in the forefront of it all. Right. I think, it, yeah, if you're going to release it earlier in the year, you have to have the money at the studio for an awards campaign. Otherwise, it's going to be to your detriment. You might get lost in the shuffle because there's such a deluge of awards bait movies that mm -hmm. come out in the fall mm -hmm. right around the time that people are voting, and given how our attention spans are rapidly 
drastically shrinking. Right. It's hard to remember what came out even in January, yeah, February. January, like, it's, February, think, think back. Honestly, think back. It's hard to remember what came out apart from Deadpool. Sure. Right. It's, well, it's, it's that switch. It's just that, that mess. Once, once you get the floodgates open up from September on, so that's why you also get lost in the shop because that's when the studios are given that straight out focus to these are the movies you should be watching for consideration. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you can't remember any of the other films except for Deadpool. You're like, right. yeah, what else came out back yeah. then? Right. So many months ago. Um, yeah. I mean, that's really that's how it works is like, you know, the, the, one, the studios that want that uh, for your consideration pump out all those Blu-rays and DVDs and send them out and they have those posters and all the magazines. So, I mean, it's, it really is like, hey, remember us? You know, don't forget about this. So you have to do that. So why not release it in that period of time? That's the, the perfect uh, reason as a founder. Yeah. They were like, look, we're we're going to be we're going to be considered. So we might as well right. make sure we're really considered. Now, there are the anomalies, because we were talking about Mel Gibson earlier. Braveheart, I think, came out in either May or June or something So mm -hmm. they, of 95. So you could, you could see there are, it does happen. Exactly. There's certain films like that that become a cultural phenomenon that right. transcend the calendar, yeah. and they're just going to be remembered all year long, no matter mm -hmm. what. All right, before we move on to our next Twitter question, I also want to let you guys know we have a huge Schmodown match happening on Friday. Clark Wolf, she is the number two contender going up against Sam Levine, number three contender. Winner plays Dan Merle, the reigning champion in August. This is a battle of titans. Schnepp, who do you got in this one? Well, I'm going to have to go with classic Clark Wolf. I mean, she's up against the mutant. I fear the mutant. Sam Levine, he's got those powers. You just play any any sound, any anything from a movie <laughs> or TV show. He hears that sound. He just can know, know what it is. So it's a frightening power. If you've seen it, you go go back into the Schmoes archives. You'll be frightened to the core. Um, but uh, with that being said, uh, Clark has got a really good talent for trivia yeah. and and being able to be chill and calm. Like I'll just blurt out an answer. People are like, Snap, why don't you calm down? I'm like, why don't you try doing this? It's not that easy. <laughs> But Clark is smooth, so I'm going She's with patient. Her. Yeah. yeah. So Dan, you know both of these characters. Yeah, I got? know them. Uh, and I got to say, I respect Sam Levine's encyclopedic knowledge of film. Yes. But I got to give the edge here to classy Clark Wolf. She is a wild card. She's hungry like the her surname. I think she's going <laughs> to take this one down. He's going to leave in tears. Mm. I'm certainly pulling for Clark because uh, I need uh, I need to see her going for the gold. Mm. I want to see Clark Wolf with the championship. I think that she has just proved herself as a superstar, but Sam Levine not gonna be easy. Be I honest, think. is this for the eventual Oscar drama about the Schmodown? Yes. Uh, the remarkable Schmodown run that Clark has had. Yes, it is. And actually, the director we can announce right now is John Schnapp. He'll be directing yes. the rise and fall of uh, the Schmodown. Yeah. <laughs> Coming in <laughs> November. Go. It's gonna be crazy, man. We're gonna release it perfect time for your consideration. <laughs> All right, there you go, guys. And then with so much more information coming out for the Schmodown. So make sure you catch that one. This that'll happen Friday, 2 p.m. PST. All right, let's take a couple more Twitter questions. Okay, Cody Hunt asks. Speaking of Lights Out 2, what is your favorite horror sequel? Man, um, let's see. Good question. Uh, aliens, uh, right off the bat. Darn it. No, we got a but bunch. I, I, would, I would argue that Aliens is not a horror movie. It's more of an it's, action, I action film. Action. Yeah. I would with, say for, for with sure, Alien giant is. giant aliens who murder yeah. you, it's horror. It's I would say, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Game over, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say my favorite, it's uh, more of a horror comedy, but uh, Return of the Living Dead. Because mm. uh, like, they took Night of the Living Dead, and then you have this sequel where it is just so goofy. You have these like, gutter punks and yeah. like a weird warehouse and like the showdowns so in good. the graveyard. It's so much fun. Well, I'll play off the dead, then I'll say Evil Dead 2. Yeah, I was about to mimic that, yeah. Evil Dead 2, but because you said that, I'm going to say Army of Darkness. But that's yeah. really the third one, but it's still awesome. Yeah. So. All right, so Natasha, you're about to ask a question from Bazinga Guy, right? No. No. What? Who do you got? Bazinga Where's Bazinga Guy? Bazinga Guy is not on Twitter today. Oh, you're yeah. looking. You're He's looking. playing hard to get. Oh, <laughs> Bazinga Guy. All right, well, what's next? Okay. Um, Movie Read Views asks and says it's their birthday. Happy birthday. Um, which earns more overall, Doctor Strange or Suicide Squad? Ooh. Suicide Squad. A thousand percent Suicide Squad. Yeah. Not even close. Yeah. Will Smith is like four De Benedict Cumberbatches in a trench coat <laughs> in terms of box office value. I'm going to go with Doctor Strange just because I, I love Doctor Strange, yeah. but I'm wrong. Yeah. 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 Well, you also, going back to what we were just talking about, too, you're, you're talking about August, the beginning of August, which has done well for a lot of movies. Like the Apes, uh, the first Apes came out. Guardians. Yeah. Guardians. 
it's a sweet spot because, and especially for a summer that has been subpar, yeah. and there's a lot of hype on Suicide Squad right now. We it's, need a good movie. It's tracking really well right now. There's familiar characters like the Joker in that movie, um, and you're gonna have you're gonna see Batman in that movie. So I don't think it's a contest whatsoever. Now we'll talk about Doctor Strange two uh, down the line because a lot of people don't know anything about Doctor Strange. I think it looks incredible. I don't think it's, I think it might be an acquired taste for some people too, as where the Suicide Squad is pretty much selling on the same premise also yeah. of Guardians. It's like, and it's, it's got that of, tasty Joker and Harley Quinn. No, yeah. this is gonna just make so much money. Yeah, it is. is. So I, does anybody think Strange will, will beat it? No. Uh, no, I don't think it's gonna beat it. I think yeah. it'll do fine at the box office, yeah, yeah. but I don't think, I think Suicide Squad is gonna just obliterate it. Feels yeah. like Doctor Strange will do Ant-Man numbers, which is yeah. great right. for an un, unknown character. Exactly. But yeah, Suicide Squad. Gonna, unless you know, yeah, unless yeah. the critics are like, it's the worst thing in the world, but it doesn't feel like that's <laughs> right. going to be the case with Suicide Squad. So. All right, last one. Okay, the last one. Well, I guess in honor of the Schmodown tomorrow, Phil asks, would you ever hold a contest to let a viewer participate in a Schmodown? What I would love to do, um, I'm hoping, and this is this still up in the air, if we go to New York Comic Con or if we go to any of these, the, the big cons down the line, I would love to do, what I want to do is I want, I'd love to have two fans go up against two mystery schmodowns. Schmo like, or, or, or it could be anybody. So like, are, you're going to get Dan Merle and Mark Riley, and the two fans will have to play against those guys. Oh, or, nice. or Clark <laughs> Wolf you know, and Finstock. And like, it, it just, it's kind of like a surprise thing. I would love to do that. There's no plans to do that, but there's, there's definitely an idea in this stupid head somewhere to do that. Um, let's just do one more. Okay, Lauren asks, what young actors do you think will keep acting and be remembered as one of the greats? Oh man, that is a good question. Pre Larson's getting there. Yeah, Tom and Holland is uh, started out very young and he's yeah. still rocking it. So I think he's going to keep going. And I'd also piggyback off uh, Brie Larson there and say uh, Alicia Vikander is another one I think is going to be around for a while. What is the name of the little girl in The Nice Guys? Does anyone know off the top of their oh, head? Man. Oh man, she, she's you know what I'm talking Spider-Man, about. Man, yeah, she, she just got she cast. She is so talented. Yeah, uh, I believe she's Australian. Uh, she, I, I apologize for not knowing your name, but you're fantastic. And I think that she's going to do great things. Speaking of little girls, Stranger Things, that oh, little wow. girl with the mutant powers is mm -hmm. a great little actress. So yeah. I'm sure she's going to have a great career. All right. That's our show for today. I'd like to thank everybody on the panel. First, it's Wendy Lee, who's been monitoring the chat room. Where can I find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. John Schnepp, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And uh, check me out on Film HQ with John Campia, uh, Comic Con HQ. Join up. And I'd like to thank Dan Casey for his triumph and return on Movie Talk. Dan, where can they find you? Thanks so much for having me. You can find me on Nerdist.com every week and online at Osteoferocious, like the crippling bone disease, but meaner because at Dan Casey was taken. <laughs> <laughs> Next to Dan Casey, Natasha Martinez, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. For me, make sure you catch Jedi Council today. Be myself, John Campion, Mark Ellis, and Tiffany Smith talking about all the latest and greatest in the Star Wars universe. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you are watching the Schmodown tomorrow, 2 p.m. Clark Wolf will be on tomorrow. We'll get her thoughts on the match, so make sure you check it out. All right, guys, we'll catch you tomorrow. Take it easy. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.